Hi, everybody, and welcome. Happy Inauguration Eve. We're so excited for tomorrow, and we thought in anticipation of that, we would um, focus a little bit on local politics tonight. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, we are Amy and Nancy Harrington. We're sisters, and we're the founders of the Passionistas Project. Um, we've been inspired by the resurgence in the women's movement to use our skills as celebrity interviewers to tell a different kind of story through the Passionistas Project podcast, our annual Passionistas Project Women's Equality Summit, and our Passionistas Project Equality Exchange events. We use our platform to shine a light on women who don't get an opportunity to share their stories, yet are making a huge difference by choosing unique paths. And we also always stay on top of what our passionistas are doing because uh, we'd like to spread the word about the amazing work they're doing and projects they're involved with. And one of those women is our friend Margot Rauder. Um, she's one of the people who inspired us to get more politically active in the aftermath of the 2016 election. And we're really forever grateful for that. Um, Margot recently served as the campaign manager for Constantine Anthony in his successful bid to become a council Yay. member for the city of Burbank. So now Margot and Constantine are candidates on the Forward 43 slate, and they're joining us tonight to tell us about an upcoming election for delegates for the California Democratic Party. Every two years, in each assembly district, the California Democratic Party holds an election to choose 14 delegates to represent each district and state. The delegates we elect will be our community's voice at the party level. So the delegates vote on endorsements of candidates, ballot measures, and the very platform and leaders of the Democratic Party itself. Um, these delegates are the party. They drive its mission, priorities, and focus and it's extremely important to elect delegates that share our values so, so that our party does as well. So we asked Margot to join us for a chat and invite some of the other candidates from Forward 43, and many of them graciously agreed. So if you have any questions for any of them, please drop them in the comments. If you have a question for someone specific, tell us who the question's for. And welcome to everybody here from Forward 43. We're really excited to have you here. And um, so we just want to start by asking you each to introduce yourself and say a few words about what inspired you to become a delegate. And we'll, we'll start with Margot. Oh, yeah, well, thank you guys. <laughs> it's so nice to see you, uh, at least virtually. It's been a long time and I'm really, really glad to hang out with you again. Uh, I'm Margot Router. I live in Burbank, uh, obviously part of AD43. Um, I come from a communications and messaging uh, profession and background, and I've always been pushed toward justice uh, in pretty much any uh, sense of the word and, and arena, and uh, that's what has pushed me towards being more politically active. Um, I helped to uh, put a rent control measure on the ballot in Burbank uh, with Constantine, and I gathered about 2,000 signatures for that. Um, uh, plus helped write it itself. So uh, very happy to be here and uh, talk about our platform and all of our awesome candidates. Uh, I'm also a uh, candidate for Assembly District 43, uh, part of the Ford 43 slate for the California Democratic Party elections coming up. So, you know, everyone, you, if you haven't uh, filled out your ballot, please fill it out, send it in. Uh, you got to send it in, I believe, by the 27th of the month. So that's important. Um, I am currently a council member, one of five council members here in the city of Burbank, and I won that election in large part due to the work that Margo did on the ground. Um, you know, organizing and getting your message out is equally as important as being a fighter for that cause. You know, there are a lot of people in this country who believe in certain things, but just don't know how to put those beliefs into action and to get those votes and to get the organizing power behind it and you know starting at a local level is uh, a place where a lot of people can get their start and do a lot of good you know um, just a handful of votes can really change the course of your town or city or neighborhood um, so you know that's really where we started and now we're moving on to this uh, statewide election Oh, 
Who wants to go next? How about Chuck? Great, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Amy and Nancy, thanks for having us. My name is Chuck Bush. I am a re Glendale resident. I'm a, a small business owner and finance educator. I teach professionals uh, about finance as well as uh, at the university level, economics and finance. And I am running for assembly delegate because uh, after working really hard for Democrats throughout 2020 um, through a group called Civic Sundays, uh, the founders, um, John Ballon and Elizabeth Vitanza have, have uh, endorsed me. Um, uh, I wanted to keep going and I wanted to get more, more involved. I've always been a, uh, someone who's interested in politics and policy, but it took me a, a long time to really get involved and um, really being able to see the, the, return on investment of um, you know, making calls and, and raising money for, for Democrats you know, all around the country was really, really great. And so um, I have uh, three, three key things that I, I'm really focused on. One is uh, education. My, my wife and I have two kids in the Glendale school system and we're really passionate about public education. The second is the crisis with our environment. Uh, my father is a nuclear physicist who worked on uh, alternative energy his entire career, and my whole life was around this this idea of nuclear fusion. And so I, I na we now see some some of the commercial applications of it, and it's very exciting to me. And the 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 third is um, equity, equity whether uh, equity um, when it comes to uh, the treatment of students in schools, uh, the treatment of people of different different races, and the treatment of of, of women. We really uh, need to really focus on that as we as we uh, uh, com continue to build the party. And I think that, that we have such a great chance now to drive the agenda of the Democratic Party uh, uh, from California, from uh, one of its most vibrant districts. So I'm really excited to be a candidate. Excellent, thanks. Annalisa, you wanna go next? Hi, good evening, Nancy and Amy. Uh, thank you for having us. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I loved attending your event on Sunday, I'm Speaking, where you had all these amazing women telling their story in honor of Kamala Harris, um, our first Black, first woman, first South Asian American vice president. It was just really inspiring to hear them speak. Um, I think I've I'm stepping up because I wanna do everything I can to help. Um, I'm, the cur I'm a current DNC Biden delegate for our district, CA 28 Adam Schiff's district. Uh, Kamala Harris was my candidate and I, did I loved um, helping her uh, campaign. And one of the best things was just meeting so many women, um, being part of K-Hive, uh, meeting all these amazing women that were leading and doing things. Um, as soon as she dropped out, I immediately began supporting Joe and also advocating for Kamala Harris to be vice president. Um, I sort of think of women as like, we're all queens. Um, you know, we all wear our crowns so well. And whenever we're in hardship, like one of the nice things is we help each other adjust our crowns. And so I really wanted to be part of that. And that was something I found through politics. It was meeting people and outreach. Um, I'm an attorney. I represent injured workers for California Workers' Compensation, and I've been doing that my entire professional career from 2004 and onward. Um, I'm helping people a lot of times in the hardest times in their life where they've suffered very serious catastrophic injuries. Um, I've never represented employers. I've never represented insurance carriers. So it's always been about helping people and fighting for their rights. Um, being an attorney representing workers, um, I'm very involved in the labor movement. Um, like I'm all about, uh, you know, helping workers, um, workplace safety um, and being involved in that. Um, I'm openly lesbian. And so I think it's really important for like women and LGBTQIA plus and for workers and for unions to have a seat at the table at our California Democratic Party. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm running I want to use my voice to help advocate for people and to fight for good policies. I think with my background as an attorney that I would be very well positioned to do that. Um, and just in terms of what inspires me, I mean, that would be my mom. Like she's a, a retired Glendale Unified public school teacher of 35 years. Um, she was shop steward of her 
union, um, the Glendale Teachers Association. So that just really inspires me. Like a good paying union job basically, you know, kept our family going, enabled me to go to college. And so I just feel really strongly about fighting for workers, fighting for uh, people. Um, and just like, you know, what inspired me to run on ADIM? Um, I mean, I voted in it in 2017 and 2019 supporting the 443 slate. I love this slate. And just like as a little memento, like I keep up in my room a Ford 43 uh, sticker. And I was just like, I think I could do this. Like, I think I could run. I think I could do a good job. Um, and you know, everything that's been said here, I've totally been active doing it, marching, protesting, um, writing postcards, texting, phone banking, donating, very active on social media, doing everything I can to get Democrats elected at every level, not just at the president or the vice president, but like every level because every seat counts, especially at the local level. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you for this space um, to tell our stories. It's our pleasure, we're so glad <laughs> and, and thank you for the kind words about the event the other night. Thanks for coming to that, we appreciate it. Um, and uh, you know, we appreciate you being here too. Um, Sean, you wanna say a few words? Sure, um, Amy, Nancy, thanks for having us on. Um, just gotta say it's a real pleasure uh, being a part of Forward 43. Um, people get to vote for 14 ADEM candidates and just so lucky to be on a full slate of 14. I think that says so much about the district that we're in and the fact that we are a really vibrant, active, progressive district uh, where so many people are just active on the issues and that's what ADEMS is supposed to be about. You're supposed to recognize and know the people who are assembly delegates because that's your connection to the party. And you know, it's been a pleasure in years previous to know members of the slate and to have their encouragement this time around <laughs> to run meant a lot. Um, I've lived in the district uh, for 10 years now. Uh, so I've been 10 year resident of Los Angeles County uh, a renter in Glendale the entire time. And, you know, I love this community. I didn't necessarily get active politically uh, outside of voting until 2018, um, but I jumped right in uh, because I really cared about uh, Medicare for All and got active with the nurses, uh, with National Nurses United. Um, both of my parents were nurses in the US Air Force. And as it dependent of service members, I received guaranteed health care through congressionally mandated programs. So growing up, when my siblings or I got sick, my parents never worried about the financial consequences of taking us to the doctor. Um, they never felt powerless or undignified in their ability to get us the care that we needed. Um, so that just really instilled in me the importance of guaranteeing health care as a human right. And it's something we can do. We can realize the beloved community that Reverend Dr. William Barber talks about, um, where each member of the community is recognized as having dignity. And it's just a decision to make it a priority. And I just believe that in California, we definitely can make this a reality. And I'm so proud that single payer is already in the California platform. Uh, so we're gonna keep it there and we're gonna make it a reality. So I'm proud of that and proud to be a part of this slate. That's great, thank you. Yeah, that healthcare is a big issue. We wanna talk more about that um, as we go on tonight. So thank you for standing up for that. Um, how about uh, Susan? You wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, um, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Amy, for inviting us uh, to be here tonight. It's really a pleasure uh, to speak to the um, passionistas. And uh, I hope that if you're not able to participate in the ADEM election, this election cycle, that you'll look for it two years from now and register for your ballot and uh, make an effort to find out who the um, who the representatives are and what, what they stand for. I'm really, really proud to be part of um, the Forward 43 slate. I think each one of the 14 members stands really strongly um, as a fully rounded individual with a lot to offer. And uh, the people are 
um, involved in different areas, um, uh, homelessness, Medicare for all, civil rights, um, the environment. And so uh, the slate as a whole is strong because every member is strong. Um, my background, uh, personally, I was a passive Democrat until 2016. And um, that was when Trump was elected. And um, uh, we just couldn't believe that happened. And I joined the local Democratic club. A lot of people don't think that there are Democrats in La Cañada. That's where I live is La Cañada, Flint Ridge. It's, it's thought to be um, pretty much a um, enclave of uh, the property interests. Uh, but there is a, a fairly active uh, Democratic club. And um, the, the way it is with most volunteer organizations, if you show up, you end up a member of the board. So um, I, I became the vice president of the club. And uh, doing that, I was the club's representative to the LA County Democratic Party. And um, so I made it a habit to always report back to the club and talk about the meetings and explain what happened and um, to tell them what the, what the county club was, was thinking about. And uh, the assembly member, uh, Laura Friedman, appointed me to be her, one of her delegates to the California Democratic Party. Uh, so as an appointed delegate, um, I've attended two of the statewide conventions, and those were absolutely amazing uh, before the era of COVID, because um, both of them highlighted uh, the people that were running for president. All of the Democratic uh, people that were running in the primary, except Joe Biden, came to um, those conventions in San Francisco and Long Beach. So um, it was it was almost like a pep rally from high school, the palpable sense of excitement. All of the people in the Long Beach Auditorium, 10,000 people were on their feet roaring, just um, all caught up in the moment, so excited. Uh, Bernie Sanders spoke. Um, uh, uh, well, I, all of the nominees spoke, at, like I said, except for Joe Biden. And um, I was participating in the Women's Caucus of the Democratic Party. And the Women's Caucus is um, chaired by Christine Pelosi. And she was talking about the things that the Women's Caucus has accomplished in California in the past 10 years. Uh, things like uh, getting board representation for women and um, family leave. And she said that the Women's Caucus has applied constant, steady pressure in every area. They never let up. They never give in. They just keep pushing for the next step. And um, I, I felt like that is what the delegates need to do. That's when we, when we attend the convention, we are representing our own um, principles and philosophies. And it's up to us to make sure that, that those are heard and acted upon and that it becomes part of, of the democratic platform. So that's why I'm running now. I was a delegate for the past two years and uh, now I'm, I'm running as part of Forward 43. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you giving us that information too. It's uh, it's interesting to get a, a look at how things work for those of us that haven't physically been able to be a part of the system. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Nikki, do you want to go? Sure. Thank you so much, Amy and Nancy, for having us. It's really exciting to be here and be able to talk with all of you and really share, I think, from each one of our individual perspectives why we came together um, and formed this slate. I think it's really great, and I feel excited to be part of something so diverse in, in so many ways, both, you know, I mean, both in gender, in race, and also age. I, it's not lost on me that I'm the youngest person on the slate. And I think the reason I chose to run, really, <laughs> I see you there, Susan. Susan and I, we, we make the, the ends here. <laughs> but it's really not lost on me that um, 
as a young person, I, I found myself very frustrated with some things that I wish the Democratic Party would have supported more, you know, and I think that constantly in the news you hear young people complain, young people want progress, young people don't do anything. So I was like, okay, let's do something. I knew nothing about ADEMs until voting in the last election. And quite frankly, not very much more this time around, but I decided to find out some more, get involved and realize that really the delegates that we vote for are the people who frame the party. They choose what we endorse, what candidates, what policies, what positions, and they really are the voice of the party. And so I think it's really important to have people that represent the wide span of Democrats out there and can, you know, re really truly represent us. And I'm happy and hopeful to do that here for 8043. Um, the other two reasons I think that were more personal for running for me were to increase diversity in the party as a young queer woman of color. I think I bring some new perspectives to the table and I, I hope that other folks can be encouraged to run as well that bring diverse perspectives from across the state. And then the other reason is as a social worker, one of our core values is social justice. And for me, it's so important to make sure that I bring that to everything I do. And I hope to fight for social justice causes like Medicare for all, like education access here in the Democratic Party. So let's see what happens. And here we go. Here's hoping. It's great. Oh, we love that. Um, and Josh, you want to round it out? Oh, you're muted, Josh. It had to happen to somebody. On the <laughs> Thanks for getting that out of the way. I'm glad it was me and it's over. Um, yeah, so I'm Josh Nooney. Uh, I'm a native Angelino and I am a civil rights lawyer. Um, I currently work as legal and policy deputy for LAUSD school, school board member, Jackie Goldberg. Um, and so not exactly litigating uh, at the moment, but uh, involved in, in fighting for public schools. And, and I consider public education uh, a civil rights issue actually. So it's, it's uh, part of a continuum of my work. Uh, but before this, uh, when I was litigating, it was mostly um, in cases against law enforcement agencies or counties that were running um, prisons or jails for the conditions of confinement or for you know civil rights violations of uh, um, people on the street who were getting stopped by police officers and sometimes ended up um, you know in very bad situations or being killed um, and uh, so my work in progressive activism has preceded that for quite some time it i think basically in terms of the democratic party uh, my main involvement uh, began um, with Bernie Sanders' first campaign um, and then the second one as well, uh, and just seeing that as a wonderful opportunity to try to push the party towards a more progressive posture. Um, and the reason why I think we're in a really important moment now and why I stepped up to run for ADEMS is because I don't think that there's ever been a more critical moment for the Democratic Party to make bold progressive change that tangibly and materially improves uh, the lives of working Americans and working Californians. Um, I think there have been hints of a kind of widening uh, sense of alienation or divergence between um, people who think of themselves as uh, working class, not, not all people in the working class, but and some of the, you know, party elite um, of the Democratic Party and the values that are kind of being uh, uh, put forward as the priorities or, or the resistance to do some things that might actually uh, change certain fundamental aspects of people's lives for the better, like giving them health care that they don't have to pay for out of pocket ever in any situation. Um, and so for me, when I was uh, canvassing uh, with Unite Here Local 11 in Arizona to defeat Trump, um, and make sure that Joe Biden was going to win. Um, to me, it was very clear that everybody's votes there really mattered. Um, but there were a lot of working class uh, Arizona residents who did not think that their votes mattered. Um, and they weren't planning to vote. And I mean, thank God I got to them and I convinced some of them to vote. Some of them I couldn't convince. They were still saying to themselves, this, I, I can't vote because it's not going to make a difference. And so for me, 
I want the Democrats to take bold action to improve those people's lives so that they can never say my vote doesn't matter, right? So that, so that next time when we go back to them in four years, I wanna be able to make the argument and really believe it because we've done amazing things over the previous four years. Um, and we have canceled some student debt. Um, we have raised the minimum wage. We have given people healthcare. Um, and so I think it's just incredibly important that the Democrats take those stands now. And I don't think it's gonna happen unless we change the party internally. And that means electing delegates like the wonderful people on the Ford 43 slate uh, who stand by these policies and are willing to fight for them within the party and say, we can't be scared of this moment. We have to meet it. Um, and so, you know, if we're going to have progressive elected officials, we need progressive delegates because the endorsement power is important um, and the platform shaping is, is very important. And so that's why I'm here. I think that's why a lot of people are here. Um, and we hope that that everybody who's listening, uh, who's in the 43rd district votes for us. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, you're all really wonderful. And, and we, as constituents, we appreciate what you're doing. Um, I want to say a couple of things. One, we have put um, social media handles for the for, uh, Ford 43 slate in the comments. So if you want to uh, follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, you can do that and you can stay on top of what they're, uh, what they're doing. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting that, um, you know, it's a kind of history, history lesson 101, but I don't think a lot of people understand what delegates do. We all know the word. Um, so could, could you know, a couple of you talk about, A, what, um, what area you represent in, um, the, you know, in the 43rd district, but also, you know, you're talking about the impact that delegates have, but how, how does it work and, and why really is it so important for people to, you know, get involved in government on this level and to, you know, this election is as important as a presidential election really, but nobody really talks about it. So can, can you guys give us a little um, inspiration for the voters, why it's important for them to get out? I, I'd like to tell a story uh, from, the, from the last state convention. And this is going back to something that Josh said, where you need to have progressive people that are willing to, to push the envelope. Um, the Environmental Caucus in the Democratic Party wanted to add the Green New Deal to the platform. They wanted the California Democratic Party to endorse the Green New Deal. And uh, there was um, at least four hours of debate. There was a great deal of um, Robert's Rules of Order where the people uh, were saying point of order point of information. And um, at the end, they decided not to capitalize the letters of the Green New Deal. So the way that it ended up going into the California platform didn't really endorse the Green New Deal. It endorsed the idea of a Green New Deal. And uh, most of the people felt that that compromise was actually a defeat. They, um, they felt that there were too many people that were accepting com campaign contributions from the fossil fuel industry in California that were unwilling to go on record as saying that um, the fossil fuel industry should absolutely be shut down. And so really every delegate um, that, that goes to the convention has a chance to vote on things like whether or not G and D should be capital or lowercase letters. Thank you. Anybody else want to add anything? I just oh. want to add that, um, like Susan, I attended the California Democratic Party convention in Long Beach, and it's just really a super experience to do it. This was pre-COVID, but seeing all the candidates and I did get to vote as a proxy voter. So that means I basically substituted for someone who wasn't able to be there to take a vote on 
party platform issues. And it's just really an empowering feeling to be making decisions that you know are gonna be affecting what California endorses and what positions um, our state is going to take because so many people look to the California Democratic Party for guidance. Um, I'd also like to add that I'm lifelong um, 8043 Assembly District 43 Laura Friedman's District, um, lifelong living in Burbank. So I love our community and I really, you know, care about what happens and I care about the policies. And just like Susan said, you know, I, I remember attending some of these caucuses and that's how the platform gets built is by people showing up and who shows up and who votes. And now it is all digital. I attended it digitally this year for the convention. Uh, or I'm sorry, last year for the convention and uh, same sort of thing, you know, like uh, taking platform stands on whether or not Black Lives Matter should be in the party platform. Like those are the kinds of things that delegates are addressing. Yeah, I'll just add, add that one of the things that really influenced me when I was asked to join the slate was just the fact that for the next two years as a, an assembly demo, uh, delegate, I get the chance to, this group really gets a, a chance to define what the Democratic Party of California and as an extension, the Democratic Party nationally uh, stands for. Um, California has always led, uh, you know, in terms of democratic politics. And I think that we we have an opportunity here to, to, to try to demonstrate some of the things, some of the more controversial aspects of the political landscape that, that can work. And uh, because California is such a big state and we have such a progressive state. So it's a real opportunity to, to move the party in, 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 a, in a new direction. And, and so when we vote on candidate endorsements and uh, ballot resolutions and, uh, and, and other, other you know, really uh, significant meetings that, that define the party, it's a real, it's re it's a really important role. I would just say one more thing to kind of fully flesh out why the endorsement power is uh, is a critical thing for good people to be influencing, um, and that is because um, California, in many uh, parts of the state, is now essentially a one party state. Um, the California Republicans are not doing too well, um, as as many of us. Uh, no, at this point. Um, obviously, there are some places where that is not the case, but in many places, uh, it is uh, It is the case. And even in places where that's not fully the case, the endorsement of the California Democratic Party can make or break uh, a race. Um, and so in terms of if you have candidate A and candidate B who are running in the Democratic primary or who even run off against each other, uh, and they're two Democrats, and then the California Democratic Party sends out literature, or like one of them, one of the one of the uh, um, one of the candidates. Uh, perhaps the party isn't sending it out, but the the candidates can say, "I have the endorsement of the California Democratic Party." That's a really big deal. That could make or break an election, and so that's the reason why it's so important that we have people uh, uh, voting uh, delegates who are shaping those endorsements. Um, to have good values and to stand for things that the voters care about uh, in the state. And um, so for that reason, it, it's, it's connecting, just, I just wanted to connect it to the real world ramifications of what happens if you elect delegates uh, like us versus delegates that might not have the same values. Because if there are delegates that, for example, don't care, then a candidate takes money from police unions they will vote and say, it's okay. The Democratic Party can endorse this candidate. And that can go out to all the Democratic voters and they can all vote for the candidate. And then we could have an elected official that lo and behold, takes money from police unions. Um, and so if you have people at the beginning, at the onset in the Democratic Party apparatus who are willing to say, no, 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 this is not cool. We actually don't want elected officials to take money from police unions because we think it negatively impacts uh, public safety and accountability and racial justice in our state. That is where you can immediately put the kibosh on that and give the endorsement to the person who doesn't take the money from police unions, right? And that then translates into increasing the likelihood that that will be an elected representative uh, within our state. And that's why, that's why this is so important. 
And just to add to that, uh, Josh brings this point up beautifully. And I just want to add our slate, uh, since this is so important to us, uh, we do not want to endorse anybody who takes uh, money from oil, gas, and coal industry execs, lobbyists, or PACs, corporations, corporate, I'm writing, reading it so I don't miss anything, corporate PACs, real estate interests, the for-profit for health, health insurance industry, for-profit colleges or police associations, as he mentioned already. So just want to bring that up. Um, we don't want bot candidates, uh, and that's what's going to really push uh, the state forward, we believe. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> we love that. Um, so we'd like to just touch on, there are so many different issues we could touch on. We could be here for hours, but we just want to touch on a couple of the bigger issues um, facing everyone. And just if there's something, if it's a topic that resonates with you and you want to just talk a little bit about your position on it and what you're hoping to accomplish, um, just speak up. Um, the first one is is probably the most important issue to Amy and I. Um, we've been big advocates for it for a while as someone with a pre-existing condition myself um, and someone who was a freelancer, a lifelong freelancer. I went for decades without being able to get health insurance until the Affordable Care Act. So um, health care reform is extremely important to us and I know a lot of you have already touched on it so if anyone wants to just talk a little bit about um, your position on health care reform. Well we've been really pushing I mean us all together have been really pushing you know for this Medicare for all this single payer this this idea of, of um, <clears throat> you know how can we change both the state party and to endorse the big uh, federal change. Um, I know there's a couple of folks on, on the slate who are more experienced specifically with healthcare. Uh, uh, Sean, right, you worked on, on this kind of stuff? Yeah, um, so specifically pushing uh, first for HR 1384, which that was the federal bill in the House, uh, Pramila Jayapal's Medicare for All Act. And you know this is something we can also do on the state level that we're really excited about and um, really looking forward to one of our legislators introducing uh, a single payer bill. Uh, Washington state currently has one uh, as does Texas, very exciting things. Uh, but we feel like we can get one here in California. Um, and Nancy, you were mentioning why it's important. So many of us find ourselves in uh, just coverage gaps because uh, we're consumers of healthcare. And uh, sometimes we can make the choice to go without coverage. Um, and that's not actually a choice though that you're making when it's something you need. Um, but just to kind of talk about a dynamic uh, within the community around healthcare and health insurance and how providing it universally um, from birth until death, um, it would change our communities. Uh, I wanna talk about a common uh, gap that maybe we don't talk about enough. Um, so we know that uh, there are maybe 8% of Californians un uninsured, just totally. Um, so that's 3 million. But there's actually 48% of Californians without dental insurance. Um, and it's just not something we think about. You know, it's the bones in our head uh, that we use to chew our food with, but like they're really important. <laughs> and it's just, for some reason, a separate product from the other product that we're buying to insure ourselves. And what we see uh, when 50% of Californians don't have dental insurance is that the providers of this healthcare are pursuing a specific type of um, procedures that are not actually beneficial for people. So you have a decline in private practices in neighborhoods and a growth of corporate, de corporate dentistry. And we know that one serves a larger purpose of shareholders and CEOs and private practices actually meet the needs within the community. So I believe that what we would see if, um, I mean, 58%, again, 48% of Californians without dental insurance, if 20 million people all of a sudden have that as a service, we're gonna see a return to the private practices and this is really important because 67% of people um, 
who don't have dental benefits are more likely to have heart disease. 50% are more likely to have osteoporosis and 20% are more likely to have diabetes. So it's not just that like you're going in for your dental cleaning. Um, it actually really is an essential part of your healthcare. It just got separated out because we have a fragmented system. So, you know, that's just a talk at length, uh, but we're gonna have better communities once we actually make this um, the type of healthcare that people in other wealthy industrialized uh, countries have come to expect. We can definitely do this in the US and we could definitely do this in California. Uh, there's a joke about health insurance uh, where the people say, I have health insurance from the neck down, meaning that they don't have dental insurance and they also don't have mental health care. Uh, most of the insurance plans that are available, even Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, Anthem and some of the big ones, um, are, are very limited. Um, they contract out their health care. You're allowed to see practitioners um, and have talk therapy. I had read an article that said that many people had left those health plans to go to Covered California because the Covered California, the public health plan in California, basically the, um, the public option, has the best health care uh, for mental health in the state. And um, I, I don't think, like Sean said, I don't think you can separate parts of the body out and uh, say that um, they're not included. The uh, universal coverage with a single payer um, covering ev every part of the human body is, uh, is just really important. And um, there are a lot of um, for-profit healthcare industries located in California. And um, I think that some of our representatives in Congress um, made their votes when uh, Obamacare was being put into place. They wanted the private insurers to still have a place at the table. And my feeling is you don't invite someone to sit at the table if they're going to take 25% of the food and not share with the other people. So in a single payer situation, the administrative fees are uh, so much lower, um, the paperwork is lower, and um, it is really the only way to um, use, our, use our dollars wisely. If we decide to have uh, private insurers involved as administrators, uh, they need to have that cap on their um, uh, administrative costs. It should be no more than 10% of the value of, of the money, of the value that they handle. Um, and that was originally part of Obamacare. Great. Anyone else want to add anything to that or should we move on? Yeah, I think just to add on to that from looking at it from the holistic side, aside from the fact that single payer is not only the intelligent thing to do financially, if we look at it, we are the only, let's say great power in the world that is not functioning on some kind of socialized medicine. And we are also the ones spending the most GDP on healthcare, which is ridiculous. And on top of that, I mean, meanwhile, that happens, we have high, high like death rates for, for people giving birth. We have, our, our life expectancy is going down. And really, if you think about it, what kind of modern world can function where people's health and well-being is tied to their job? I think for me, as like Annalisa, I grew up with a union family. I, you know, I was a Teamster baby and my whole life I had the best health care you can imagine in California. Then I worked for the state legislature and continued to have the best health care you can imagine in California. And now I don't. And I find myself in a place where I had to make the decision between my career and going ahead and taking the next step and having a higher paying and a job with more responsibilities and make the decision between that and the great health care I had and a pre-existing condition. And that's a position that nobody should be in. That doesn't just hinder you healthcare wise, that hinders you in your whole life. That's, you know, overall well-being. 
And I think California is a leader, you know, California will lead in that. And if we can get through it, I think that's going to expand to the rest of the nation. I would just like to add to that too. Um, you know, I became involved in supporting Medicare for all back in starting in 2016. And I marched um, for Medicare for all. And I became involved in it through the coalition of labor union women supporting healthcare for all. And, you know, um, yes, you know, I, being involved with the Teamsters, I do have Teamsters health coverage, but, you know, nothing is certain, you know, helping injured workers, you know, sometimes an injury comes and people lose um, their health insurance, their private health insurance. And so we really need a system where everybody's going to be in, nobody's going to be out. And that includes if, you know, you, know, you lose your job um, or if you're undocumented or if you're a child, like we should, it's really a universal human right issue for me, um, for healthcare. They're really just, everybody should have healthcare. And so I strongly support Medicare for all. And that's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be on this slate is because I think everybody here is a very, very strong advocate for Medicare for all. And all of us were involved in democratic clubs. Um, I'm a vice president of the Glendale Democratic Club and involved in a lot of other clubs as well. And I know there's and I've, like everybody on this uh, slate is very super involved at all levels. You know, the Forward 43 slate believes that healthcare is a human right. Uh, we also believe that housing is a human right. And that's the other big issue facing the state right now. Um, people are being evicted and going homeless and not able to pay their rent. I mean, COVID has exacerbated an issue that was already long time in coming. Uh, rents are skyrocketing, mortgages are you know, unable to even be afforded by the average working class person in the state. And it, it, it has a detrimental effect on communities. And so we really want to, you know, advocate for change at the state level, the, you know, Costa Hawkins and the Ellis Act. These are all things that, you know, individual organizations have been signing, uh, you know, gathering petitions and putting it on the ballot to try to get the, the, um, uh, the voters to overturn it but at the end of the day the legislature can do that like these are issues that our democratic majority is abdicating to private organizations and nonprofits. we elected these people we endorsed these people we put them in office they should be doing the work that we the people want them to do and so by you know really tackling how we endorse candidates with really tackling what our priorities are at a, at, a, at a state party and platform level. We can tackle things like the Green New Deal, like Medicare for all, like housing reform, criminal justice reform. These are huge issues that start, you know, top down on the platform and endorsement level, but begin from the ground up by grassroots activists like all the members of the 443 slate. I have to, I'll just jump in really quickly to say that um, uh, I, th I think the pandemic certainly highlights the, the, the need for uh, public health care. I mean, there are people who, I mean, you know, who can't, can't be treated uh, or you know, uh, have limited options for treatment um, because of this pandemic. And it's just very dangerous for, for, our, uh, for our society not to have some, some sort of uh, kind of safety net for people. Uh, I, I personally am not uh, necessarily in favor of, of Medicare for all. Uh, I think, but I do think that Cal covered California has worked really well. Uh, Obamacare has worked really well, and and having a public option um, is, is is really important. And I do think that uh, that that healthcare companies have uh, and insurance companies have a tremendous amount of power. So. Even if you even if you like your private health insurance through your company, um, you know the, the there are so many. When you go to get an operation or some some sort of procedure, the insurance company won't tell you how much it, it costs. They they won't tell you. There's a there's a rate card for every for every position with every insurance company, but. But you don't know going into. I have a son with who who had who's had two eye operations. The, 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 they can't tell you uh, what the cost will be within you know, an order of magnitude. So 
so I do think that having public a public option, uh, having state funded and nationally funded med 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 healthcare is is really important uh, for our country. I, you know, I, I think that that you know, um, others who have who other who have different options uh, should should take them, but there are so many people who don't have that option. Um, we have a question from someone who's watching. They want to know, and, and anybody that can answer this, um, with single payer, how do you guarantee someone can keep their doctor if their doctor is a specialist? Does single payer imply one size fits all? You know, healthcare is a right. How do you find a balance between what we have and single payer? Uh, I, I can answer that with a different question. There's no guarantee that you get to keep your doctor with your current health insurance. So we know that health and health insurance companies are bought and sold every couple of years. They change providers. Your doctor changes providers. Your you know whoever your carrier is could suddenly drop an entire medical group. So there's no guarantee already. So the idea of creating a national or even if we could a, a statewide, uh, either fully state funded or possibly public option, whatever that looks like pushing for that goes hand in hand with pushing with the ability to keep your doctor, to keep your provider, to keep your specialist. Like these are the things that people want. Nobody wants to trade one for the other. Why not both? And th this is the, 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 the standard operating procedure of right-wing propagandists that say, well, if you want something good, you gotta do something bad. That's, that's not true. This is not a zero sum game. There are ways of getting everything that we want and we just have to advocate for it. The solutions are out there and that's what we're working on as a slate. Yeah, and to the, oh, on, go ahead. Yeah, to the person's question, you know, we talk a lot about, or something that gets invoked a lot uh, is this idea of freedom and, you know, freedom within health plans. Um, but I think what we actually mean is what the person's asking about is, do I actually, Get to see somebody? Is it going to be possible for uh, me to get this service um, from a healthcare provider? And uh, Constantine, I really appreciate you bringing up that issue of providers uh, themselves being displaced by hospital closures. Um, of course, my parents, after they retired, um, we've moved several times because um, ho rural hospitals that they worked at ended up being closed. Um, and that's just a vicious cycle that we see um, continuing since the ACA uh, was passed. So there's something structurally wrong that needs addressed uh, that can't be ignored anymore. That, that growth uh, since tw 2009 in deductibles year after year, it's a straight line upwards. Uh, and for every extra thousand dollars in the deductible, that's healthcare that somebody's not gonna have functionally. Um, just because they don't have the ability to take on that debt. Um, so we have to change this uh, so that people actually do have that meaningful freedom, that meaningful access, because uh, these aren't just words, um, it's, it's a real ability to receive care. And you know, providers themselves deserve the certainty of living and working in a community and being grounded there. Uh, rather than being pushed out by the decisions that, um, you know, other, other interests may have. So, yeah, we, we can build long-term stability within our communities by switching to single payer. I just want to mention, since we're all here, uh, we all signed on to a petition to push Newsom to get a waiver to do Medicare for all in California. Uh, so I've signed it, like I said, uh, and everybody else can do the same if you go to petition.healthcare. Uh, it's pretty easy, just petition.healthcare. I'll put it in the, uh, the Facebook link as well, so everybody can sign that. And then just to add on to and kind of wrap everything that everybody's been saying with a little bow, um, this isn't as controversial as I think some people think, or it shouldn't be, right? Like. Chuck mentioned there should be an option and Sean mentioned really important things about our deductibles and everything. These all th these are things that can be done. And like Constantine mentioned, it's it's a Republican myth that they can't be done. We have examples if you hop across the pond. You know, the you know, 
Germany has a great medical system. Taiwan has a great medical system. The Swiss have a great medical system. And they're all different systems that all stem from that same idea of single payer as an option. And we could really learn and take from any one of those systems. But what we really have right now should not be referred to as a healthcare system. We're in a market. This is a market. And I, I genuinely think that education, healthcare, and our rights are not for sale. And if you'd like to keep your doctor and things like that, you should definitely have the right for that. And, and you would in a system that allows, you know, for, for coverage for everyone. And I think it's just, we just need to have that discussion instead. I think we, what we as delegates can do and what the entire, you know, folk of people that are in the Democratic Party can do is, is vote for delegates that will support these conversations. Our discussion should be, you know, what kind of system we want to create, not should we stay in a market or go to a single payer system. I, I would just like to point out that when you have single payer uh, universal health care, the single payer is the only game in town. So if a doctor or a hospital chooses not to participate in that market, then they're walking away from probably uh, 50 or 75 or 80 percent of um, their source of income. So um, in many places, you will see a two-tiered system where the publicly funded health care um, is available to everyone. And then there are additional doctors who, who make appointments for things on a cash basis. So um, it, it's almost impossible to, to take the money out of, of health care completely. But um, if, if the government fully funds the uh, health care to the extent that is truly justified, then the payments to the doctors will be within the market prices. It won't be um, you know, a third of what they would get otherwise. So as a single payer health care, every doctor and every hospital in the United States uh, would be included in the system. Excellent. So let, let's shift gears just a little bit. And this is, <laughs> again, another broad topic that we could talk about for days, probably. But um, we'd like to just hear your thoughts, the Slate's um, stance on social justice issues. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about racial equality, women's equality, disability equality, LGBTQIA. Um, where do you guys stand on, on some of that stuff? Well, I think the biggest one coming out of this summer after uh, George Floyd was obviously in Black Lives Matter and what to do with local policing. There was a phrase that everyone was using this summer called defund the police. And we talked a lot about, you know, what that means as a slate and why we would run as a state uh, uh, um, delegate. And so for us, when we looked at criminal justice at the state level, it's very much different than talking about individual uh, police and cities. So we really focused on, you know, the criminal justice element of it. And, and we really wanted to uh, uh, focus on um, not necessarily that phrase that was used all summer, but what it meant and what it meant to everybody who was, who was running, everyone who's voting. And, uh, you know, I, I work in a city district, I work as a council member, and that's really your local office where you can affect uh, uh, the change of your local police department. So really for us at the state level, it's how do we create a party platform and an endorsement process that puts candidates who want to fund social justice and want to fund community development and really get you know, folks into college and trade schools rather than the school to prison pipeline like that's that's really the focus of what we need to be doing at the state level. But you know, go around to all of your other districts. I know there's people watching who aren't in AD 43 and talk to your local elected representatives and ask them, what are you doing about policing? What are you doing to hold uh, you know, the LA County sheriffs uh, uh, accountable? Like these are issues that you can get involved in at the local level and then talk to your slate members who are running as delegates and see what are they doing to support those movements at the state level. Uh, 
And Los Angeles County did something very important in the uh, last election, and we elected George Gascon to be the um, Attorney General of the County of Los Angeles. And that's probably the best example of what Constantine was saying as a county official. Um, he sets the guidelines for how people are sentenced. Um, and they have these weird things that are called enhancements, which are like post-it notes that you stick onto the person and they just keep adding years in prison. So um, George Gascon has said that they're going to walk away from mandatory uh, sentences and they're going to walk away from enhancements. So um, that means that people will have shorter sentences. They're more willing to go to trial. Uh, we'll be sending less people to prison uh, for less time. And um, the budget can be allocated to helping people that have uh, encountered the criminal justice system, helping them to set up an alternative way to live their life, teaching them a vocational trade, uh, teaching them the skills that they need to balance their checkbook or um, what they need to understand about signing a lease or um, signing up for a credit card. And by doing that, we'll have good citizens um, having good jobs instead of people wasting their lives at $80,000 a year per prisoner. So, so that's um, what the district attorney does at the county level. We also have a district, we also have an attorney general at the state level. And most of the, the big prisons are state prisons. Um, so it's, it's also a matter of, of budget priorities um, for people to be willing to spend the money on the social programs that are, are proven to be successful, which are, are alternatives to imprisonment. Thanks. Um, I guess the, the, the it's, a, it's a pretty broad question, uh, uh, Nancy. Uh, and I, I, I guess what I would say is to focus on, <clears throat> I think the, the kind of the the conversation around Black Lives Matter and and the you know the movement for Black Lives in uh, I can't remember if it was June or July there was a candlelight vigil held at Glendale City Hall by um, led by uh, Black parents of uh, in 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 uh, in Glendale and the uh, and it actually corresponded with a uh, with a march that was planned by a, a high school student in Glendale. And that event, uh, there was so much angst about that event among business owners and how would the police respond and how would people respond? And there are really some great lessons that came out of that. One is that, um, that, that people of all races see that there is racism out there, there is, systemic and structural racism out there they 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 understand they're starting to understand it and 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 that's that's important um because um the you know, but people are trying to to say that black lives matter or the protesters are agitators or communists or or all these things and those are classic tropes that go against the fundamental um fundamental uh, tenets of our of our, of our constitution and, and go against what, what, what this really is. Those are people, uh, parents who are saying, look, uh, we're, we're not always treated fairly. Uh, we're not always treated fairly in the workplace, um, uh, certainly in, in criminal justice um, and, and many, other, many other forums. And people understand that. Um, we had uh, we have people of all races and all, all you know the, the Armenian community, which is which is uh, uh, thirty percent of uh, Glendale's population, came out really strong on that day. Uh, chief Provolitis of uh, Glendale PD chief uh, said on TV, "Black Lives Matter," and 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 that's so that's really important. Um, and and so these are patriotic Americans. These are people who love this country and uh, and are fighting for it. And 
that's one of the reasons I jumped. I wanted to get involved in this in this in this uh, you know in this uh, uh, election is that that you know you have to stay involved and 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 so I think it's important. The most important thing to take away from from the events of the summer is that people, uh, Americans, patriots, aren't going to believe that those who fight for the lives of black people and the lives of people of color and uh, and the lives of other marginalized people are 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 not uh, going to be labeled as show socialists and anti-American. They are the heart of America. They are the truest patriots. And uh, and so we see that here in our district, uh, people coming together um, when the um, the Artsakh uh, uh, war uh, uh, started. Um, um, people, you know, uh, my, my son drew a little, a little, you know, Artsakh strong sign on his own because he understood that the Armenian community had come out for black people in Glendale um, earlier in the year. And so we, we have to, we have to take the, uh, the events of the, of, of 2020 and uh, use that as, as fuel to come together, to have difficult conversations and to figure out how to, how to move forward and keep our democracy strong. And so the Democratic Party, I'm a lifelong member of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has always offered that vision for how we do this together in a big tent. And I think uh, that's, that's really what we have an opportunity to do in, you know, as ADEMs in the 44, 43rd district. Um, I think Shirley Chisholm was the, the person who said, if they don't offer you a seat at the table, take a folding chair. But with the Democratic Party, um, we don't look at it as a zero sum game. It's not as though there's one pumpkin pie. And if someone else comes to sit at the table, we're going to have to cut the pumpkin pie in smaller pieces. So every single person that comes to the table means that I get less pie. It's not a zero sum game. The Democratic Party says, we'll make another pie. There's plenty of pie. And that's, that's what you mean when you say it's a big tent party, that um, we're willing to put our resources into govern government, which is uh, basically um, our taxes or fees, but we expect that the government will step forward and help people uh, and provide equity for people that need um, just a little bit more so that they can join the community. I agree with everything that's been said here. Um, you know, I marched multiple times um, this year or last year for Black Lives Matter, taking the knee multiple times, eight minutes, 46 seconds. Um, and I would just say, you know, as a white person, like it's important that black people are leading these movements um, and that as white people, like we try to be anti-racist, like not just uh, that we actively are anti-racist in what we're doing. Um, and just as a lesbian woman, um, like standing in solidarity with black trans lives matter. Um, and I would, I did that march um, in the summer in place of a pride parade, it was a black lives matter protest um, to honor black trans lives. And so just as a white person, just like showing up and being supportive of black lives matter, um, and doing everything that we can. Um, so I just wanted to add that also just personally, I favor reparations um, for the historical wrongs, um, eliminating all the redlining that even to this day still exists in our neighborhoods. Um, as an attorney, um, eliminating bias at all levels and having more inclusive representation at all uh, corporate levels um, in the law and in our elected officials of women, black, people, uh, indigenous, um, and actively eliminating all these barriers that have existed along the way. Like I strongly supported, um, you know, um, the bills that were out this year um, to eliminate bias um, for affirm affirmative action. And I, I'm in the Black Caucus just to show support and to promote these 
policies and as delegates, I think everyone here will do those things and step up um, to make sure that we're eliminating bias at all levels and actively being anti-racist and, um, and doing a lot of these wrongs that exist. And I think Annalisa just touched on something that's really important. This, this is like Chuck mentioned, a really broad question because racism and issues of race do not just touch police brutality, unfortunately. It spans everywhere. And I think we need people of color that come from every single walk of life and every single area and, and you know, have different biases. For me, I'm biased towards education justice. That is my fight. And so for me, the fact that affirmative action failed this year was so disappointing. And I hope to see different moves that allow brown and black kids like me to go to college, you know, and to be able to get the resources that will actually help us get there. And that is just one facet of where systemic racism plays. You know, it's in healthcare, it's in business, it's everywhere we go. And I just hope that if we uplift more voices of color, we can learn from more folks that are making dents in these different areas. Uh, and I'm just gonna add that I think, you know, you guys asked in broad terms about social justice, right? And um, obviously, I think, you know, in our introductions, we all talked a little bit about things that I think include social justice and, and in our motivations for why we're, why we're here in the, in the first place. And then in some of these answers, you've heard even more. Um, in terms of the, for the people, for those among us, myself included, who have not been party insiders before and do not understand exactly um, everything that's going to be presented before us to vote on. Uh, it is basically when you're voting for an ADEM candidate, you're voting for somebody whose political instincts you trust. Because, you know, for, for example, I'm not exactly, though um, we do have a lot of issues in terms of criminal justice reform that still remain to be accomplished uh, in Los Angeles, including our incredibly unaccountable sheriff, uh, who, who needs to go, but that is a county position, right? And so I'm unclear in what way as ADEMs we will be able to somehow utilize the state Democratic Party apparatus to try to influence the process of creating more accountability for sheriff's departments. There are potentially ways that we could do it. I just don't know what's going to come up exactly and or what resolutions we might be able to come up amongst ourselves to propose for certain types of, of reforms that would address the, uh, the reckless um, uh, behavior that he has been exhibiting in his relationship with civilian oversight. Um, that being said, when you're voting for an ADEM candidate, you're looking for somebody who's going to have their antennas up for opportunities to make positive change within the party to try to tackle some of these issues. Um, I believe that there was a bill put forward uh, to, to prevent police officers from being able to go from one department to another when they had had disciplinary uh, uh, histories that may have not succeeded. There's a possibility that at the state level we could try to uh, implement some reforms uh, with regard to that kind of movement, right, with regard to police officer records, stuff like that. So uh, I'm, I'm just saying that um, it's a broad question and um, it, it is also the case that I think we have to be humble about, you know, the fact that we don't know everything. We don't know everything that's gonna come our way during our time serving as delegates and representatives of the district. But, you know, I think that you've heard already, uh, you know, from everybody here, a real commitment to social justice in many forms. Um, and, and I have no doubt that we're gonna be fighting deliberately and, uh, and bravely uh, uh, for on whatever issue uh, uh, crops up in a discrete sense when it, with regard to an endorsement or a particular law or a part of the platform that needs to change. And that's really what Forward 43 is about. I can show you, you know, another dozen candidates in the same district who all want Medicare for all, who all want housing reform and criminal justice reform. But the 14 people on this slate, they're the ones who've done the work. So when you elect us, to get on that floor and there's a floor fight and we need to get votes and whip people to vote the way we need them to change the wording watch what's being said you know really craft uh, the party platform and craft the endorsement process you're trusting in us to do the work not just believe and vote the way you want us to 
but can we argue with the people around us? Can we debate in a constructive manner? And the people that you see on this screen here have done that. We've done it for years. All 14 members of the, of the Forward 43 slate know what we're doing, can get in a room and get stuff done. And that is really a key component to these elections. All of us know what it's like to fight with the political will that it takes to get what we need in the state. That's fantastic. And, and, and we're grateful to you, all of you for that. Um, we really are. We're, we're getting to a point where we kind of need to start wrapping up. We, first of all, we know social justice, you know, is like throwing spaghetti at a wall. So thank you for, you know, honing in on some, some really specific issues within that very broad topic. We appreciate it. Um, we want to encourage all of you, our panelists to read, uh, you know, there are a few comments coming in. Some people have some, some interesting ideas like um, Marvin has an idea about, uh, he calls it the green police. It's officers without guns who patrol the areas by foot. They know the local businesses. Um, they, you know, people know them and feel connected to them. So there are a couple um, ideas like that. There are people are dropping in the comments. So, you know, come back later if you have time and check them out. Um, but I wanted to ask a question. And this is, um, this is actually from someone in Pennsylvania who's watching. Um, and, uh, but I think his question applies to local people as well. And I think it's great that people are, are watching, tuning in from different parts of the country tonight. So um, he says, um, I'm a registered Democrat living in a rural deep red county in Pennsylvania. A representative from uh, the PA Democrats asked if I would run for local state office. Do you have any tips or suggestions for running? A lot of beliefs I hold seem so obvious, but it's against the local beliefs. Take gun, gun control, for example. The second you're outed as a Democrat, you automatically are after everyone's hunting rifles, even though that's what, not what was said. So, um, you know, it seems like you all come to this from different walks of life, and some of you are newer to it than others, but do you have any advice for someone that wants to get involved? I'll, I'll say one thing. You don't know what it's like until you run. And I would say, do it. Get your friends, get your endorsements, talk to the party, go out and do it. Who knows, you may win, you may love it, you may hate it. But if you can go out there and run with honor and integrity and just run a clean campaign, the campaign you've always wanted to run, a winning campaign. A winning campaign. That's, that was the advice I was given when I ran for my first election that I lost <laughs> spectacularly. I was told run a winning campaign that comes in third place. And so that's what I did. And you know, Margaret helped me on that one. But it, it doesn't take much. I mean, small elections like you know, the city council races or ADEM races or, or neighborhood council races or, or town council races, whatever it is, go out there and do it. A school board race, a, a, a community college race, just do it and see what happens. And that's my advice. Uh, and Constantine, if I remember correctly, you you kind of had this awakening to get involved after the 2016 election, right? This isn't something you've dedicated your entire life to, but you now are, you, you know, as you guys said, you're a seasoned professional now in, in this world. You know how to, to fight the fight. So, you know, I think you're a really great example of you can I change never, your mind you to get involved. You have told me four and a half years ago when I was, you know, uh, uh, calling Arizona to vote for Hillary Clinton that I would be an elected official, I would laugh about <laughs> what are you talking about? That's not what I'm gonna do. I mean, Susan, you went through the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, going back to the specific point that uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania brought up, and there are some single issues that set uh, Democrats apart from the Republican positions. And one of those is gun control, the Second Amendment. And I think that it would help a lot if um, that gentleman can remind people that the, the NRA fanned a lot of hysteria and that they um, widened the divisions in our country and that most people don't agree with the NRA. And to also say, that Democrats support gun safety. We support registration. Um, we support 
uh, lockers where uh, people can keep their guns away from their children. If you um, read the positions from uh, March for Our Lives or um, uh, Moms Demand, their requests are really reasonable. And um, they are not about taking guns away from people. They're about gun safety, not gun control. So you can, you can, um, you can be a member of the Democratic Party in a rural area if you, if you understand your true policy on that. I guess I'll add, add one, one point, which is that I, I, uh, I went to grad school in Pennsylvania and I know people who still live there. And on a Facebook post, so, so, someone you know, posted something that was um, a radical right fascist uh, third party. And um, so that was in Pennsylvania, that was in rural Pennsylvania. Now, I know that these, that the, these movements are, start, are, 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 are happening all over the country, but I, I know they're happening in Pennsylvania. And you know, January 6th told us exactly um, what all true patriots are up against. And so if you are in that more conservative county in Pennsylvania, and you believe in the, the ideals and principles of the Democratic Party, uh, and you are a true patriot, you must run. You, you're called to run. You have to run because otherwise, the, the people who are, you know, who've taken over the Republican Party are going to keep winning and, you know, threatening our democracy even more. So please run. Yeah, I would just echo that. Um, please run and please step up in your community. Um, I mean, I think one of the best things is like, you know, canvassing, getting to know um, voters. This is my first time running in ADEM, um, but it's been a really great experience just meeting people, connecting with people. And if you like doing that sort of thing, I think you'll really enjoy it. And I, I believe we have to fight for every seat. Um, you know, there's some great groups out there like No Dim Left Behind that is actively working to elect Democrats in like very rural red places where Democrats no, have never run and some of them are winning because it's more just like, well, I think it's a lot of it's just connecting with people in your community and if they're good policies, like so, so many rural places, they, they need Medicaid, you know? Um, and I think if you're fighting the good fight, I think people are gonna be attracted to that. So please run, thank you. And at the end of the day, just Ted, I mean, I'm also born and raised Burbank, which feels like a small town, not rural, but small. And what I would say is don't underestimate the, the how far each individual contact can go. At the end of the day, people, most people who are true to themselves are not thinking about Republican or Democrat. They're thinking about how you as an individual made them feel, quite frankly. And if, if this person who's running in Pennsylvania can connect with voters, can really run in, in, in this election and treat it like a local election, whatever seat it is, treat it like it's local, talk to voters, get to know them and truly know their issues, you have a, you have a chance. And if you really care about where you are, I think you have a chance. And I think people can smell when somebody truly cares about, about this election and the seat and the people in the county. So go for it. Uh, absolutely. You have everyone here's support to run. So I hope you're already like signing the registration and all that, um, filed your paperwork. Uh, but yeah, the, the point is just to don't write yourself off. Don't write anyone else off. There's always more votes, uh, definitely in this country where a lot of people sit out elections. You can encourage more people to sign up in this election, this small little ADEM election. We have a 300% growth in the number of voters. Isn't that crazy? Like so many people are finding out about this election for the first time because we're running, because groups like Sunrise are getting involved and they're turning new people out who have never voted before in this election. So that's the exciting thing. You can activate new people who care about their community, who wanna effectuate change within the community. And if you're going through that process of talking directly to people, hearing them out, uh, then it doesn't really matter uh, that you're running as a Democrat in a primarily red 
uh, district, if you are truly listening to people and you haven't written them off, then they are going to vote for you. I totally believe it. And the, the first campaign that I ever got involved with, uh, and I'm from Texas, was the Better or Work campaign. And I was inspired to work the phones for that because I love that he went to every single county in Texas and spoke to just as many people as possible, uh, holding the smallest town halls. And yeah, just didn't write anybody off. He talked to them directly. And I, I think that's the way forward. We, we can't write each, each other off as a country. Uh, we got to reach out to each other. Excellent. Well, we have gone way over our time allotment, so <laughs> we will let you all get back to your lives. Um, but we cannot thank you enough for joining us tonight. I want to remind everyone who is listening that this is about, about half of the uh, Forward 43 slate. Um, ballots are due, mailing mine tomorrow. Ballots are due by the 27th. So um, everybody who's in the district, please um, send in your ballots for these wonderful people. And if you're in other districts, please vote. And uh, Amy, you wanna wrap it up? Yeah, and if you didn't get your ballot this time, if you weren't educated on this part of our government before tonight, then do it next time. Stay involved, follow, follow you know, Forward 43, learn what they're doing and, um, and stay, connected so that you know what's uh, what's happening next time around. We are we put the Forward 43 uh, social media handles for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter in the comments. If any of the panelists want to um, um, put any other contact info in there, any of your personal handles, we absolutely welcome you doing that. We just didn't want to put uh, any info that you didn't want to share in there, so feel free. Um, I have to apologize, we had some technical issues at the beginning, so um, people may have missed the beginning of this night, but we are gonna keep it live on our page. We're gonna share it to all of our different social media um, outlets, so feel free to do the same. We want people to go back and watch this from the beginning and get all the information um, that is really important and, you know, I know I speak for Nancy when I say we are so grateful to all of you for doing what you're doing. Uh, it's really inspiring. It makes me want to find out more about what I can do beyond what we're already doing. So um, thank you all so much. And thank you so much in this crazy busy world we're in for taking the time to do this with us tonight. And if there's ever anything we can do to support you as a group or individually, just reach out. This is what our platform is all about, is spreading the word and uh, helping people who are doing good things do more of it. So please stay in touch and let us know how we can support all of you. And to everybody who watched tonight, thank you so much for um, being a part of this. If you have questions after the fact, if you go back and watch the beginning and you want to ask questions of the candidates, I'm sure they'd be happy to pop back in or we can tag them um, to ask them to respond to your questions. So. Don't feel like just because the live is over that the conversation is over. We want the conversation to continue. So thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you so Happy much. Happy inauguration. Thank Have fun you. tomorrow. Yeah, and good Thank luck. Thank you so we'll, much, we'll be voting Amy for and Nancy. You. Thank, Thank you. you. We hope you think of running too in the future. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll keep it in mind. Can we run together? <laughs> yeah. It is the last one. Honestly. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Everyone. Good Thank luck. you.